Hey, good. Good morning. It is a tremendous privilege to be here this morning to exchange insights with colleagues from all over the world about an urgent topic for all of us, the health and welfare of our children. In the brief time I have with you this morning, I want to make three points. First, the world has failed in its responsibility for the health and well-being of children, especially girl children and their mothers. Second, we already have plenty of clear and specific Roman Catholic teaching from Rerum Novarum to Pope Francis about the dignity of the person, universal common good, gospel option for the poor, and solidarity. Pope Francis has called us to be a church of the poor. The speakers yesterday expanded on these values beautifully. Now what we need is greater commitment to make our values effective. Third then, and most importantly, the real barrier to maternal child health is lack of political will. Political will means the commitment of an entire political community to protect important goods and achieve shared goals. Sadly, most of the world's societies, including my own, the United States, do not have an active commitment to ensure the health and welfare of all children or of their mothers. The lack of political will was identified by Pope Francis in Laudato Si as the most important barrier to reducing climate change. It is also the most important barrier to global health justice, including justice for children. At the end of this presentation, I will turn to a few hopeful examples of action for change. But first, I will develop my three basic points about first, the lamentable state of maternal child health, second, the clarity of Catholic teaching, and third, the widespread lack of political will to make real changes. First, then, is the unjust lack of health resources for children and the interdependence of children's and mothers' health. Every time a child comes into the world, there is another person who is just as intimately involved in the birth as the emerging baby, and that is the mother. The mother is also key to the survival and well-being of the child after birth, not as a natural or biological necessity, but as a cross-cultural fact. Mothers are typically the most invested and reliable providers for children. Yet women also typically have access to fewer resources than men do to fulfill the responsibility of care. This is even more true when families and whole communities suffer from injustices such as poverty, war, racial ethnic discrimination, or forced migration. Within these conditions, women and children, especially girl children, bear the greatest burdens. The concrete realities are shocking. UN statistics verify that over 5 million children under 5 die each year mostly from preventable causes. Sub-Saharan Africa, where one child in 13 dies before their fifth birthday, has the highest rate, but the greatest percentage of newborns dies in South and Central Asia. Furthermore, 250 million children under five are at risk of poor development. At least 400,000 children under five risk death right now from malnutrition in the volatile Kasai region of the Democratic Republic of Congo. In Afghanistan, diarrhea still claims the lives of 26 children under five every day. In India, due to sun preference and the dowry system, the mortality rate for girls under five is 75% higher than for boys. 
Malnutrition rates have skyrocketed among Rohingya children, refugees in Bangladesh. And care for Rohingya infants now being born under, in under-resourced camps is a challenge for young mothers who are often survivors of violence, trauma, and rape. Yet even when there is no unusual emergency, the risk of a woman in a developing country dying from a maternity-related cause is about 33 times higher than in a developed country. Maternal mortality and pregnancy-related disability are direct results of poverty for which we all have a global responsibility. They are also the result of the so-called feminization of poverty. In many developing countries, women and girls traditionally eat last and have lower quality food, which often leads to poorer nutritional intake and serious effects on pregnancy, newborn health, and lactation. This means that an intergenerational approach is crucial to the health and welfare of children. Second, let's turn to Catholic social teaching on health justice for children and mothers. Catholic teaching has recognized the rights of children since rerum novarum, yet children have still not received the emphasis they deserve. Children's rights receive the most attention in the compendium of the social doctrine of the church, which states that the 1990 Convention on the Rights of the Child has been ratified by the Holy See, yet also states that the health and welfare of a majority of children globally is far from satisfactory, despite the existence of a specific international juridical instrument. This is a perfect lack, uh, sorry, a perfect illustration of the lack of political will to implement what is affirmed in theory. The compendium names specifics, lack of adequate food, shelter, health care, education, human trafficking, child labor, child marriage, bare survival as street children, and forced participation in armed conflicts. The interdependence of children's rights and women's rights has not been explicitly recognized in Catholic social teaching, but there is a precedent. Pope John Paul II praised the maternal role of women and in the very same documents decried abuses against women that make it impossible to fulfill that role. Specifically, he named lack of equality in family, society, and workplace. There are few, if any, countries, including my own, a so-called developed and privileged nation, where women do not carry a second shift of domestic labor where they receive equal pay to a man doing the same job and where they have access to the most remunerative jobs. Women are the world's primary food producers, yet women have less access to land, livestock, financing, and the cultivation of profitable crops, even though they are most responsible for children's welfare. In his 1995 letter to women, Pope John Paul decries injustice to women and admires women who have fought, quote, for their basic economic, political, and social rights, even at the expense of being criticized for a lack of femininity. Indeed, women's equality is essential to their fulfillment of the parental role. Pope Francis reiterates these very same themes in Amoris Laetitia, depicting, quote, older forms of traditional family marked by authoritarianism and even violence and lack of equal access to dignified work and roles of decision making, unquote, as abuses of women's human rights, and he uses the word rights. By calling attention to the role of women as mothers, Pope John Paul implicitly establishes the equal rights of women as a precondition of fulfilling maternal responsibilities. Yet how often have male-female complementarity and the idea that women should be honored as mothers been distorted 
into perverse and unjust excuses for making women labor from dawn to dusk, for excluding women from basic resources, and for requiring women, mothers, and little girls to sacrifice their own well-being. Clearly, this is contrary to the spirit and letter of Catholic social teaching. Now then, let us turn to a third point, the lack of political will to change exclusionary practices harming mothers and children. Cultures everywhere pay lip service to the protection of children and respect for mothers and families. But how rarely do we dedicate real energy and resources to these ideals? This is where we, the church, are called to make a difference, not only within our faith communities, not only by relief initiatives and charity, not only by the work of Catholic NGOs. We must mobilize partners across religious faiths and cultures to make maternal child welfare a practical priority, as well as a legally and politically recognized obligation. We need global bioethics and international legislation. We need national and local laws. We need collaboration with governments, civil society, and business. Yet most of all, we need a change of heart so that we can break the hold of customs and biases that keep mothers and children at a lethal disadvantage, because only then will these international agreements be implemented. This change is needed not least of all in so-called first world countries like the United States, where it is easy to ignore the suffering of children far away and to overlook the degree of complicity we have in the poverty and violence that blight the lives of many. As Pope Francis said in relation to climate change, UN documents and agreements have been largely, he uses the term, ineffectual, because the interests of the powerful override the common good and the needs of the poor. Due to lack of political will, he says, high-level summits are unable to reach truly meaningful and effective global agreements. The same judgment applies to the UN Convention on Rights of the Child or the UNESCO Declaration on Human Rights. The answer for children, as for the earth, is public education and mobilization, which must become bigger practical priorities of the Catholic Church. Members of local churches, including women, must be active participants in defining the needs of mothers and children and devising strategies to meet them. The Catholic vision promotes the rights of children as members of families. We must all ask ourselves what we can do to be allies and advocates of vulnerable children, women, and families. How can each one of us create greater momentum for justice? We are all the church. Now let us consider some signs of hope. In addition to the two excellent presentations yesterday on Santa Gidio and Kuam, I offer three more examples. I emphasize collaboration and cultural change, which comes from within local communities, not just from outsiders. A first example comes from India. In Uttar Pradesh, Catholic Relief Services partners with Vatsalya, an Indian nonprofit that trains community workers to improve the health of mothers and children, especially girl children. They're working with a U.S.-based software company that develops mobile technology to help NGOs serve health needs. This project, called Remind, showcases the collaboration of faith-based justice initiatives and for-profit business along with members of other religious traditions. Remind utilizes trained health activists and the cell phones of local families to identify danger signs during and after pregnancy, to support breastfeeding, and to improve childhood health, nutrition, and, and immunizations. Remind aims to increase awareness of and social disapproval 
of discrimination against girls and against mothers of girls. Education of mothers is a very important factor, but it is also key to involve mothers-in-law and fathers, since they have decision-making authority and control family resources. Changes in basic cultural attitudes and everyday behavior are necessary. Yet it is not easy to create sufficient political will, even when Catholic teaching is clear. For example, in 2010, the Indian Bishops Conference issued an excellent document called the Gender Policy of the Catholic Church of India. This life-affirming document calls on church and society to recognize violence against women and girls. It urges mass education on equal access to good nutrition and the needs of pregnant and lactating women. It even prescribes that church institutions provide maternity and paternity leave. Yet these messages have been very slow to get out to the grassroots, as I learned from the pastoral experiences of my students, uh, pre-seminarians and women religious, at Dharmaram College in Bangalore. Once more, lack of political will, even when the Catholic Church teaching is very, very clear. Situations of family power dynamics and women's subordinate status affect children's well-being in many parts of the world. Research across 20 countries has shown that involving men in the health and nutrition of pregnant and nursing wives and infants can increase uh, better care seeking and better care for children. Of course, program designs must be sensitive to local gender norms and avoid a negative effect on couple and family dynamics. This is why leadership of local communities is key. I have an example from Nicaragua, but I'm going to skip that because I don't want to go over my time. And I want to conclude with a third example, which is from my own country, the United States of America. You may be surprised to learn that in the US, the risk of dying as a newborn is only slightly lower than in Sri Lanka and Ukraine, according to UNICEF. Again, poverty affects health and survival. 33% of African American children suffer from poverty. 28% of Latino children, 27% of Native American children, but only 10% of white children. In addition, immigrant children entering the country alone or with family face special dangers. So far this year, 36% of migrants apprehended at the U.S.-Mexico border were unaccompanied children or family units with children. Among the dangers they face en route are hunger and thirst, physical injury, rape, trauma, and trafficking. Once in the U.S., children may be separated from parents by border agents. The U.S. bishops are publicly prioritizing immigration and immigration law. But this social justice agenda has not yet made a significant difference in the behavior of American voters, including white Catholics. We see it again, a lack of political will. Vulnerable children suffer in a political atmosphere in which immigrants are demonized and the administration of President Donald Trump threatens to build a wall separating the U.S. from its southern neighbors. A sign of hope is the Kino Border Initiative, founded by the California and Mexican provinces of the Society of Jesus, the Missionary Sisters of the Eucharist, and the Catholic dioceses of Tucson, Arizona, and Hermosillo, Mexico. This alliance unites Mexican and U.S. religious orders and dioceses and advocates for change in cultural attitudes as well as immigration law. It provides direct service on both sides of the border, including a shelter for women and children that provides medical and perinatal care. The KBI conducts educational research and collaborates with other churches and civil society to change 
American attitudes, especially regarding immigrant children. In conclusion, then, radical change requires better national and international policy, but it also requires a conversion of hearts, a change in worldviews, and an active commitment, which is what John Paul II called solidarity, an active commitment to put action and resources behind the words of dignity, care, and justice. As a worldwide institution with a presence in local communities around the globe, the entire Catholic Church and every Catholic, as well as our partners, have a tremendous opportunity to make a real difference in how justly children are welcomed into this world. They are all our children, no matter where they live. We are all the church, no matter where we're from. We are all responsible, no matter our role in the church, for the demands of justice and the call of the gospel. We can and we must make real changes. Thank you.